So um, during Hamlet's off-sighted advice to the players, he compares them theater to a mirror. And he says, the purpose of playing whose end both of the first and now was and is to pull the mirror up to nature, to show virtue, her feature, score her own image, and the very age and body of the times, form, and pressure. And if we take Hamlet literally for a minute, um, this mirror held up to nature would not find virtue's feature and reflect it to her. Uh, a mirror held up to nature um, would reflect Ariton, uh, or, you know, nature? Uh, I wasn't sure, but it wasn't going to do this complicated work that Hamlet suggested it was going to do. Um, so, I knew, because um, I didn't know the play and I know how to make sense of complicated language, that what Hamlet means is that he wants the performance of the murder of Gonzaga to extract Claudius' guilt, um, and uh, his guilt for murdering King Hamlet. But this is not a mirror that I've run across. In Hamlet's formulation, how the mirror does what it does is not examined or illuminated, only that it's held and things are found in it. So I might understand that what Hamlet is calling for in this theater. I know that he wants this performance to sort of extract particular salient parts of the nature that's in front of it. Um, but cognitive linguistics allows me to look at how he's able to make that meaning. So let's take a step back and try to explain what I'm talking about. So um, the idea that metaphor exists in thought and language is that we think metaphorically and we project um, our experiences in our bodies, in our, um, in our concrete experiences, on the more abstract ideas. So we're able to say um, that Juliet is the sun because we are pulling information from the sun and we use it to think about Juliet. Of course, we don't think that Juliet is a flaming ball of gas. We understand what it means. Um, we, we're not confused. We understand how to selectively pull information from the sun idea to make sense of the Juliet idea. And we do this in other ways, too. So um, the idea of trying to figure out what it means to know something is pretty complicated. It's very abstract. But I do know what it means to see something. And I see it, in, and it goes into my eyes, and then I see that thing. Um, and so we talk about, I see your point, or um, her argument was getting hazy. And, and we understand this, this idea of knowledge by thinking about the, um, the visual system. So this is just sort of the, the way in which that um, Mark Lakoff, uh, George Lakoff, who was one of the earlier um, thinkers on conceptual metaphor theory, talks about um, how we make sense of language. It's embodied and it's creative. And then uh, Jules Bocognier and Mark Turner explore how thinking and speaking create networks of association. So it's not just a metaphor, it's actually a, a network of associations that get compressed and blended um, to create new meaning. So this, in these sort of networks of association, certain ideas are, are salient, certain ideas come up, and other things are, are masked. Um, so what about this mirror that Hamlet's talking about? Uh, it's definitely not the mirror that I see in the morning. That's not actually me, but um, I, that's the mirror I found. It's not the mirror that I use when I'm driving my car. Uh, and it's not Magritte's mirror. It's not even the mirror in this um, Arnold Beauty's wedding portrait, which would be the kind of mirror that Hamlet had access to at the time, um, which is a, um, a convex mirror that does strangely abstract external things into the picture. Um, but it's not just that, because that's not specifically just extracting um, other things. It's also, um, if, you know, he, he does mean it to kind of not editorialize. So, um, so what I found through researching the kinds of years that, that Shakespeare would have had access to, um, as well as her political tracks at the time and other ways in which they thought about the mirror at the time, um, was I realized that this mirror that he sets up at the center of the play is a complicated network of ideas. It is simultaneously um, a sort of flat, perfect mirror. Um, it's also the, this convex mirror that's able to kind of um, pull in information from outside the frame. And um, it, it, it involves the holder of the frame, because obviously, um, although the, the grammar of the sentence are hides the holder, um, it's the holder that's angling the mirror. So what we have here is a mirror that reflects without distortion 
and also distorts. And there's an intention to it. This is a mirror that's held in order to extract guilt from um, Claudius or to show virtue in her future. So for Hamlet, then, the purpose of playing is a blend or an integration network. Um, the goal of theater is both unmediated, it simply reflects what it sees on virtue's face, and intentional in its angles, since it has a goal, a purpose. It can neither be accidental or random. The reflection shows virtue and score in the details of their outward appearance, while conveying the exemplarity of one and the vice of the other. The fact, that, the fact that Shakespeare sets up this network of ideas at the center of his play is not just a demonstration of a contemporary idea theory of linguistics. For it, for it to be useful for me, it needs to help me think about the play differently. So I want to believe that this poetry sort of scaffolds meaning in the play. In other words, um, once we have this idea set up of this mirror that can do all of these complicated things, we can use that idea um, to think about other ideas in the play. And, and indeed, that, um, that is true. I think that we, um, there are a number of different places in the play where we see Hamlet questioning the way to know something by looking at it is clearly not quite working. There are a number of places where there are doubles. Um, obviously, Laertes is sort of a double of Hamlet. Um, there's a, you know, there are places even where uh, Horatius talks of the ghost and says, I knew that I father, these hands are not more like. So the language does continue to evoke or play with this idea of a sort of a mirror that both is and is not um, a perfect reflecting tool. Um, so I did find ways in which you could think about the play as a kind of research into what does it mean to know and what's stable information and what is not and how do we go about assessing what the truth is. So then what I wanted to do is say, well, could this be helpful for a director or am I seeing it on stage? And I did find, I saw a number of productions of Hamlet, and I saw many, many, many that used the mirror, um, either as a prop or as a set decoration. Um, and I started to think, well, this doesn't really work. I don't the mirror, if you know anything about directing on stage, the mirror is very challenging because you can't control where it's reflecting and the light's going everywhere and it's reflecting the audience. It doesn't reflect what you want it to. And then I saw a production um, of Ingmar Bergman's at BAM. Um, and, and it struck me that he was maybe um, getting close to what I was interested in. And um, what I saw was that he creates the idea of a mirror on stage through the use of symmetry. Staging. So um, the coronation scene, for example, and the final fencing match are they both staged symmetrically. So we can see this constantly duplicated members of the court and the sort of knees on a beam of red rope then. And we have the image of Laertes and Hamlet. Um, and in the dual example, we have the, the, the mirror at almost um, state scale, so that it, it's held in balance as the two go back and forth. And through this doubling of images, Bergman locates the mirror on stage in an absence. So he doesn't stage the mirror, but he starts to um, almost evoke it in our minds through the staging. And this place is equidistant before, between doubles and, and where the reflecting occurs. And I think in this way, he was able to successfully stage the idea of the mirror as this lacuna. Um, and, and his staging, I thought, was successful because it didn't stage a mirror, but it reminded us of all of the things that we think of when we think of a mirror. Um, and there is another example of his use of a uh, retracted stage night. Um, so there are ways in which he's, he's treating the audience to, or he's helping Shakespeare's language by highlighting some of the mental spaces or the idea, association of ideas that we think of when we think of the mirror, and then generating it in Staging without doing it. So, back to um, building characters. So, um, I became interested in how we make sense of characters and, and, and the way in which certain casting was talked about as right and other casting was thought of as wrong. It struck me as interesting that we didn't have enough of a good language to talk about casting um, when, when it went awry and what it meant to say something was believable or relatable. So, in my, what I found, or what I believe, is that casting a character creates qualities. That while casting directors do this professionally, all of us do this when we make sense of the people around us. 
Although we usually think of character building as a process whereby a person comes to have a more poor character because of difficult experiences or being a little wacky. Um, the process of building character, both our own and those around us, fictional and, um, and professional, is a process whereby we cast information from one domain to the other, building up layers of meaning and a networked assemblage of, assemblage of bodies, <coughs> histories, biases, actions, and words. And of course, casting is historically specific, right? When we say um, something is sort of talking about traditional casting or non-traditional casting, it doesn't really make any sense because obviously the way Shakespeare did casting, uh, or Shakespeare's company did casting, or Moliere did casting, um, it was very different from the way we do casting now. Um, and the studio system, of course, had a different way of, of casting. It was almost a kind of secretarial job where they had, you had a type, um, you were the doctor type, or the villain type, or the Vixen type, and you basically, it was, you know, it was who was available. Um, when the studio system started to dissolve and TV began, there was a room for a casting director. Uh, and the elevation of this person was slow, um, probably because it was considered sort of secretarial. Um, Mary, Mary Doherty was one of the earliest um, successful, famous casting directors. She did the casting for The Graduate. Um, and when she, and the book, of course, calls for a blonde man shortly out of college, and of course the person that she, um, everyone wanted was Robert Redford. And she manages to convince them that that was not necessarily the best casting, despite the fact that he clearly fit the description uh, in the book better. Um, and um, when Dustin Hoffman was first cast, everyone thought that he was clearly miscast and that it was going to be a huge mistake. Um, but actually, the, the idea of Benjamin Braddock, the character of Benjamin, Benjamin Braddock, was, was a concept made manifest in the casting. That's a character that doesn't really exist um, without uh, Dustin Hoffman's body. So the way I started thinking about it was, was that there was a tremendous amount of information we were, were failing, sort of failing to see that, that went into how we thought of uh, an actor being right for the part. And that obviously there was the text or the line said about him in the play or said to him or said about him, um, things he does in the plot, well, at this point he's going to sleep with his girlfriend's mother, or he's going to kill his uncle. Um, but then the, and then for some parts, I think there's extra textual information. And obviously, whether you've read the book before, um, or if it's a char historical character uh, like um, Catherine Graham, you have other information other than the text in the screenplay that you're working with. And then you have the actor on stage, the age, race, and body type. And I don't believe that, that ever disappears. I don't believe that you can successfully act past your age, race, or body type, or gender, sex characteristics. And then the actor's background, and whether that actor is known at all, or is completely famous, whether you've seen him in a big million roles, I think that that goes into the process whereby we construct these characters. So let me look, look at an example of casting and advertising, um, and then sort of explain to you um, how I'm making sense of this, of the, the sort of complicated idea whereby we create characters. So this is an advertisement. Um, there are three kids in surgical gear holding a knife, scalpel. Um, and uh, we've got a body on the table, a clock behind them, and, and the, the headline says, Joey, Katie, and Todd will be uh, performing your bypass. This threatening scenario probably persuades the viewer to read the text in the body of the ad and what horrible situation am I in where Joey, Katie, and Todd will be performing my bypass. And the, the text explains that our education system is not training students in the kinds of ways that they're, the kind of knowledge that they're going to need, um, and that if we, with this reduction of the standards of American education system, um, is going to eventually affect me. Um, and now I'm wishing I supported education, is the work that the ad is trying to do. I don't actually think that in the future we're going to allow seven-year-olds to perform surgery, um, but I, I understand that what they're conveying is that they're compressing the intellect and the skill of seven-year-olds with the role of a doctor. So I'm able to build this character that's a hypothetical, doesn't exist in the world, but in this ad, in this hypothetical situation, these seven-year-olds are performing my surgery. 
by casting these kids in these roles, um, we see this critical task as uh, being, prepared, being performed by unprepared students. They were poorly educated in the past, and I didn't seem to care enough to support education, and now they're about to cut me out of it. I don't think that I'm usually afraid of doctors, and I'm certainly not afraid of seven-year-old kids, but in this situation, I suddenly got my emotions involved, and now I'm very afraid of these seven-year-old kids performing my surgery. So then I think let's support um, education. Um, but again, this comes to me despite the logical weakness that the ad is working with, because of course supporting education it does not necessarily mean um, that my future doctors are going to be good at my bypass, and it doesn't necessarily mean that um, that um, these three kids are, are going to, to be educated. Um, but in this, this uh, world that's been created by this casting choice, I understand that supporting education will generalize to a more likelihood that I will be um, better served by my, my surgeon. Um, and so we have the parts, which are the surgeons, and the script, Joey and Katie and Todd, and then this casting is just a depiction of these seven-year-old bodies. The ad strategically miscasts these characters in order to make a point. So, uh, of course, the famous um, example of, of brilliant miscasting comes from Hamilton. Casting a Latino as Alexander Hamilton and African American as Aaron Burr does not confuse our historical recollection of the character, nor does it ask that we look past the race of the actors. The casting creates new characters in a network of history, future, and um, America. Casting Lin Manuel Miranda is not about myesis. It's not because he looked like Alexander Hamilton. It's not about bestowing opportunities on talented performers. It's about how the racial and ethnic makeup of the performer speaks with and through the story of the birth of democracy. Without representing on stage the young, scrappy, and hungry people who might rebuild democracy now, Hamilton isn't Hamilton. If the body playing the part does not match the presumed race or gender of the character, spectators learn protocols of reception that question the central importance, the normality and invisibility of white male bodies. So this idea of countercasting, casting that strategically miscasts actors in roles presumed to be race, white, or gendered male, can help us change what we think and how we think. We can, it helps us to start expanding our categories of, of who belongs in what role, of who we expect to see in the position of a leader, of who we expect to see in the position um, of um, a founding father or a judge. There isn't one answer, though. I think, take for example, Ocean's 8, the, the recent Hollywood movie. Um, lovely ladies playing roles that were traditionally written for lovely men, but the New York Times wrote um, about these many re reboots that happened in the last six months. Uh, these reboots require women to relive men's stories instead of fashioning their own. And they're subtly expected to fix these old films, to neutralize their sexism and infuse them with feminism, to rebuild them into good movies with good politics, too. They have to do everything the men did except backward and with ideals. So I'm not saying that, that we should suddenly cast everybody as a woman or a person of color. Um, but I am saying that, that these, these strategic miscastings offer us opportunities to rethink our categories. And I would definitely say that we're seeing a tremendous amount of this kind of casting. So in the last year, um, I saw Lear, um, I saw Sean McKenna as Lear, and um, this is Jim um, Maison as Gloucester, and um, Brown and Gresham. Toronto. Michelle Terry was Hamlet um, on Shakespeare's Globe stage. And in uh, March of this coming year, um, Glenda Jackson will be returning as Leah to Broadway. So do these just offer more parts for women, or are they doing something truly creative? It does call attention to our protocols of reception, but the idea that these are gender blind is patently ridiculous. Gender is more visible, not less. And that's true with, um, I think, cast, smart casting of um, different um, races or bodies. Countercasting invites us to question these protocols and, and also our interpretation. 
it asks us to start rethinking about um, about what what, what what counts as a woman, what counts as a man, what counts as um, a citizen. But just because these are women in men parts does not change the history and reality of the bodies under the costumes. As August Wilson said about colorblind casting over 20 years ago, to cast us in the role of mimics is to deny us our own competence. It's not, counter-casting isn't gender blind or race blind, it's gender and race attempted, and it changes our protocols and invites us to shift and expand our categories. So another great example um, recently, obviously, was Melissa McCarthy as John Spicer. And I think one of the reasons that made this such a, a, an evocative um, example was that um, her, I would argue that her female body underneath there was part of what made it particularly ins insensitive to, to the Trump administration. Um, but we're seeing a lot of this. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, performances where um, we have gender um, and casting being used as a creative force in contemporary performance. So Target Martin, um, in their production of Pay No Attention to the Girl, um, they use different races and genders um, to, to do a lot of their parts. But what I was struck by, actually, was this moment at the very beginning of the play um, where um, one of the actresses, Caitlin, I believe, um, starts the play by saying, Hi, I'm David Chriswitz, the director, and um, I'd like you to turn off your phones and invite you. And it's not commented upon, um, but, but what it does is it makes you realize that it reminds you, oh, this is a play, and she's taking on this part, and the just going to take on another part. And it uses um, this momentary confusion around, well, I know she's not um, David Chriswitz, the director. Um, but it, it, it forces you to look at those, those assumptions and to make you realize that in, in a theater, you get to decide to be whoever you want. Another example of um, this company is actually here, um, is Sister Sylvester's The Fall. Um, and in this production, they actually cast a chicken as a famous director. Um, and the chicken is live on stage, and they're talking to it, and the chicken is going around. Um, and obviously, there are a tremendous number of things about it production I thought was really exciting. But, and this obviously having a lot of chicken on stage is hilarious. Um, but it wasn't that about that. It was about the sort of creative force of, of deciding um, that in this particular moment, the chicken is going to play the director. Um, and then um, recently, Forest Entertainment's productions of Complete Works um, tell the story of all Shakespeare's plays, um, and they cast, they use household objects. So um, I believe, I'm not exactly remembering exactly which one this is, but um, so the ketchup will be um, Rosalind, and the linseed oil is Orlando, and they tell the story and they move them around. Um, but again, it's amazing how powerful these stories are, and, and we, we're, we're able to go with it. Okay, so finally, I'm, I'm interested in, in what I'm thinking of as staging cognition. These ways in which, through being in, a, in, a, in an audience, um, theater is, is helping us to look at our own assumptions about what it means to think, what thinking is, what it looks like, um, and our own assumptions about how emotion works, how the body works, and how, um, and, and how, um, how cognition works. So when most people think of theater, they imagine sitting in a dark room and watching actors pretend to be characters acting out a story as if the audience isn't there. And I realize I'm not talking to the right audience, because anyone here right now is not at all expecting that kind of theater production. You guys are far more, I'm sure, sophisticated. But you do probably know what I'm talking about. Um, the, the idea of theater generally in America still is that I'm going to pretend I'm going to sit behind, I'm going to pretend that, um, that the actors are really in their own role and they're going to pretend that I'm not there. And, uh, and I'm going to pretend that when the woman walks on stage carrying the groceries that she just came in with groceries and not from backstage. And, um, and then when they start arguing, I'm not going to get up and try to stop the fight. Um, we have this idea of willingly suspending disbelief and pretending that it's all happening um, and that there's going to be a secret and there's going to be emotion stored inside, and then they're going to come out in some big explosion, uh, and then we're all going to um, um, feel like 
something different happen. Spectators of varying levels of fluency in the conventions of theater may know that the bobo makes the light look like a tree on the floor, and not that it's actually a tree. Um, but we expect to stay quiet and read the story being acted out, and to find the meaning, to figure out what is this a symptom of in these characters. Naturalism and realism responded to the earth-shattering ideas of Darwin, Marx, Freud, and Comte, thinkers that detach the human from God, put them in relationship to family, environment, money, and sexual desires, and insisted it could be studied. So the theater that came out of this incredible intellectual movement of the 19th century um, was about staging these ideas of class struggle, of inherited traits, of repressed sexual desires, um, and of a society that has influence on each other and, and influence from, from the environment. This defined theater for more than a hundred years. Think of street car named Desire, or the Cherry Orchard, or Long Day's Journey into Night. Characters with internal psychologies controlled by their genes, their drives, and their socioeconomic status. We watch them as in, yes, I too have an inside. Deep feelings and memories that will haunt me until I purge them dramatically. And I'm quite sure it's all my parents' fault. This genre of theater stages this Freudian self and this Cartesian mind, where I think with my brain and there are deep feelings going on and down there that I don't want to deal with. And this is really valuable when that's what we thought was going on with the human, <coughs> when this was the dominant scientific paradigm. More and more, though, I find myself in with spectators who are engaged in the environment of the theatrical experience, not asked to make meaning, in fact, generally frustrated in an attempt to make meaning, but given opportunities to enact an experience. Through engaging with this strange experience, this moment in the theater, we're charged to find new ways of picking up, of exploring the ideas involved. This is the kind of theater I'm seeing now, theater that stages an embodied, embedded, and extended cognition. Okay, what the heck does that mean? So um, there's a sort of relatively new set of theories in, in cognitive science and philosophy um, that's called 4E cognition. Um, and I'm sure that if we, you know, you talk to somebody, they might say there's a fifth E, but I hate when people start talking about that. Um, but what, what this basically means is that, um, and there's a spectrum. Um, embodied cognition means that we think with and through the body that we have, that cognition isn't um, separable from the body. And this can be anything from, well, obviously what I'm thinking about has to do with how much food I had that day or how much sleep I had, to um, recognizing that there are certain things that I, I, I think only because of the body that I'm in. Um, embedded cognition depends heavily on offloading cognitive work and taking advantage of affordances or potentials in the environment. So, um, so this might be, for example, how um, the way you think in your, your office space is different, that a certain amount of the tasks that you need to do, you, you sort of set into the environment. Extended cognition argues that actually we think that the, the thinking extends beyond the skull, beyond what they could say the skin and bones, um, into the environment. That um, it, it extends past the boundaries of the individual organism, encompassing aspects of the social, interpersonal environment. So we think with and through um, the environment we're in. Um, enacted cognition means that it's inseparable from action. The thinking is actually what happens when we walk across the stage without falling or without um, getting lost. Um, when we sit down with it, with, by adequately figuring out where we need to, when and how to lower our body. And that, that thinking is, is not something that um, is represent, represented, it is, it is a process that we, we take in the body. So um, this is a, a picture of a prop table, um, which I love because it's a, a, an obvious, clear example of thinking with and through our environment, um, that by setting up the props this way, you can more quickly get back on stage. You don't need <coughs> to think about what you need, you know where you go to the table. Um, now there's a, um, this prop table can be seen as an example of um, epistemic action, uh, which by, 
uh, an, an action that we take to actually literally change the way our thinking works. But what I'm talking about in terms of theater is that I believe that theater is providing an experience that enables spectators to shift their conception of thinking. So there's a, a theorist um, philosopher named Alvin Noe, and he um, has this idea of caliber, which I really love. Um, and he says, don't think of a concept as a label you can slap on a thing, think of it as a pair of calipers with which you pick the thing up. If there is a difference between seeing something and thinking about it, it is because of differences in our calipers. So this to me suggests um, a tremendous value to, to thinking about our calipers because if you don't have the right calipers, there are certain situations you won't be able to pick up. Uh, and this is true of ca categories as well, which is some of the blend, of, I mean, some of the character stuff. So I want to talk about a theatrical experience that would fall into this idea of, um, of a new kind of theatrical experience. And there are many I could talk about, but the, um, there's one um, that I experienced was um, um, environment responsive or site responsive um, performance in London. And, um, and I went, London in 2012, I was jet lagged. Dream Think Speaks production of The Rest of Silence. It's a sort of adaptation of Hamlet. And when you arrive, uh, you're told that you won't be able to leave the room, so if you need to go to the bathroom, you've got to go to the bathroom. And then you're shoved into essentially this sort of warehouse space, uh, maybe about the size of this room, and the walls, um, it's all dark and empty, and the walls have sort of large black windows on them um, that are darkened. The audience, the room fills as the audience comes in, and um, um, everyone is sort of walking around. When the lights go down, I notice people start to get a little nervous, um, and I'm nervous too. Uh, I've never been in a large room like that in the pitch black with a whole lot of strangers, and it occurs to me that usually I'm safe in my seat. And so I, I know that the, the usual contract whereby I'm not going to do anything weird and no one else is going to do anything weird, but if they do, at least I have my little seat and I'm safe, is suddenly broken. And I know that I'm free to walk around as is everyone else. But then the lights change and, and, these, and these spaces open up. And the, they are happening on all four sides and various scenes from Hamlet happen all around us. Um, the first scene, Claudius wakes up out of bed um, and he goes into a little room next to his bedroom and he's practicing his speech, um, the coronation speech. And he can't get too much too far through it before he gets frustrated and then starts again. And throughout the play, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing characters rehearse. We're seeing characters set up for scenes that they're about to take to do. Um, and then he, when he washes his face in the sink, we actually see um, the, the, the perspective we see through the water um, through a screen on the, the ceiling. So our perspective shifts over and over again as we're walking around this room, making a choice as to which characters to follow, which things to, to pull apart. It requires us to know the play, and it requires us to some degree, um, and it requires us to, to shift our perspective over and over and over again because we're physically moving through the space. And I think that by being made aware of our watching, of the choices we're making to consume this production, I think we're, we're being staged in relation to the action. We're invited to move and we're taught to see. Ophelia practices what she's going to say to Hamlet about those remembrances of his, or Rosencrantz and Guildenstern practice how to sound believably casual to Hamlet in order to make sense of this. We have to call our knowledge of the narrative and we and well as our understanding of rehearsal and pretense. Throughout the play, the audience is given perspectives that highlight our perspective and call attention to the <coughs> perspectives that work in the play. Our bodies stage this as well, since we must, move, we must move to change our perspectives. The audience moves and flows from wall to wall, conducting its own way through the play, bumping into each other, spreading out, closing in, ebbing and flowing like a murmur of starlight. I have to move around, I have to get out of the way of that tall guy. Um, I'm involved and engaged in the perspective from which I watch this performance. This kind of theater does not ask spectators to diagnose internal emotional duress or psychological problems. 
at most, as most 20th century theater does. It's not teaching us something like a moral or attempting to evoke emotions, like a medieval morality play or a melodrama. It gives us something to do and frustrates our desire to find meaning. We are rewarded for engaging and frust and pretend, sorry, for, for patiently awaiting the opening up of presence. We know the narrative to know English is to speak Hamlet, and that her narrative must be relied on to make sense of the fragment. This Hamlet does not have an abstract scene, and I'm struck by how the repeated rehearsal, the obvious performativity, and the centrality of our shifting perspective means that the whole thing feels like its own abstract, catching our conscience as we ebb and flow around the room. So I'm seeing a lot of this kind of thing. Um, Robert, I'm sorry, Richard Maxwell's work um, often has a completely different idea of how emotion works. And um, the characters and their presumed emotion are separated, descended. So we're, we're constantly being asked if, if we're feeling what the characters are feeling, are we feeling something totally different? Um, another production of Hamlet um, actually invited the audience to be part of the, the, the casting of Hamlet. The first part of the play involved three potential Hamlets sort of auditioning for it, and then the audience had to get on stage and choose their Hamlet. So this idea of instability, the instability of the character, the instability of knowledge um, was, was made part of the performance. Thank you. Thank you. 
have the in large part what's happening in the outside world today. Because everything that was sort of set in form, this does he does this, she does that. Now it's it's all blurred as you can see just from the recent two weeks. So this strategic miscasting made me look at the new theater, some of which I've seen and which I have to grasp to understand. It gave me a better context for it. So thank you. Yeah, I think that, um, I do think that there are plenty of examples of casting where it's um, it's not necessarily strategic as casting. So for example, and, and I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but there, um, in the Burnham or Hamlet that's now on, um, it's obviously a play about about a, a, an odd casting choice. Um, not the first, not I mean, the first, but not the last at the time that a woman played Hamlet. Um, but there, one of the um, the women in it who plays her Ophelia is a is a black woman, um, and that's not at all common at all. I don't think there's anything I don't think there's anything there about it. But what's beautiful is it's this kind of undertone of another sort of counter casting that's happening. It's not asking us to interpret differently or to think differently about that character. It's just simply quietly having this presence of um, of an expanded sense of who belongs. Um, even though it's not, it's not, we don't, that character isn't being commented on or challenged. Um, but I do think that that's right. And, and the reason why I find it, the, the idea of casting, is because I do think that it's important because of what's going on. I do think it actually does matter. That if we think about casting as something that we're actively doing, and these categories we're making um, are, are alive and changeable, um, then we can, we can look at them and we can say, well, what, why is it that we, Decide this person is presidential and this person isn't. Um, what makes it that um, you know? I assume that if a man wants to go to the white coat, I've already decided he's he's my doctor. Um, and there are a lot of ways where I, I see people who are playing with countercasting, playing with performing a role they don't belong in, in order to start messing some of that up. And I do think there's potential there. Please forgive me because I didn't come at the beginning. I was at another event. So if you already dealt with this, then never mind. Um, but if I hear you correctly, I'm listening to what you're saying, and the only way I can agree with you is to change the words that you're using. Um, and I think when you're talking about looking like counter casting, I personally, having worked in business, I don't look at it as counter. Casting, I look at it as not labeling with assumptions. Um, if I'm going to cast somebody, for me, it's what does this character represent? What is he dealing with? What is his emotional, uh, what's on the edge of him viscerally? Um, that's not about making assumptions that go with skin color, hair color, gender, etc., etc. But it's not the same as counter casting, which I hear as saying, I made those assumptions. And then going against them. To me, that's just as incorrect as the first way. I think, what is the character about? What is the psychological dealing? What emotions are at the core? It's the opposite of thinking. It's all about feeling. And how does the feeling express itself in action? How does the action decide what the audience is thinking about what's the surrounding? For me, the emotional truth is what's the most important. So I apologize if I've completely misunderstood what you're saying, but I'm sitting here listening to, I guess, the last 20 or 30 minutes and thinking, I don't see it that way, but maybe I misunderstood you, so I, how do you respond to that? No, that's great. First of all, are you a casting director? Hi. Do you do casting? Uh, okay, I'm, I worked in the film business for a very long time. I did some theater. I'm essentially, from the time I was two and so now, which is multiple decades, I'm a dancer. So I go, even though I was a literature major with a lot of writers and direction and directed actors, blah, 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 I'm going to write to, what am, what, am I, what am I feeling? What are you giving off in that space where actors do what the writer can and the writer should lead it out because you let the actor and the director and the audience fill that in. Got Okay, well, so first of all, I'd say, I, I think you're, you're, you're right about the sort of challenge of the idea of counter. Because I'm not looking at it from the perspective of making the choice.
choice. Um, I'm looking at it from the perspective of looking at a choice that um, looking at a choice that's already been made and saying um, that it is strategically miscasting. And I sort of mean those in quotes. So, so for example, Lin Manuel Miranda is 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 an example from Hamlet, from Hamilton, because. Um, it's not that he it's not that he fits or doesn't fit. It's not that he's counter to our expectations. It's that through this casting choice, other things have broken open. So it's not about um, it's not about fine. It's not about um, um, you know it's not about being counter to gender or counter to race. It's about countering a narrative about identity through casting differently. So by casting the, something in a different way, and by calling our attention to that way in which it fits and doesn't fit simultaneously, we're able to imagine new possibilities about who we are. And it's not just, I mean, race and gender is the most visible, celebrity is the most visible, but it's not just that, because it's also about sort of how we operate in our everyday lives. The other thing I would just say is that um, I don't think there's any difference between thinking and feeling. Um, I, 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 I think that I don't think it's possible to think without feeling. Um, I think that that's an idea that, that sort of comes from Descartes, but it's also um, dangerously sort of gendered. And, and, and obviously, in the theater, we all talk about sort of getting, you know, getting out of our heads and using our feelings. I, I just don't. I don't. I don't think that that separation is, is possible. So I agree with you. It's just a question of the strategizing. Do you have time for one more question or comment? Thank you so much for coming.